What's up guys, this is Teddy. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This video, we're going to be starting the Spring MVC tutorial for beginners. And this course, we are going to be building a meetup clone for runners. So why should we even choose Spring MVC? The reason is that there's a lot of jobs in Spring MVC that are going to be easier to get for newer programmers, self-taught developers, and new grads. It is fun to build apps in the newest, shiniest framework, but a lot of times most employers are basing the reason to build apps around a specific use case, and Spring MVC actually works better for smaller applications. And many businesses and corporations still need smaller apps, and instead of having a decoupled application like a application with microservices or Angular and React, a lot of times it makes more sense just to have everything in one package and deploy it as just one big unit. And that is the reason why there are a lot of jobs and there are a lot of opportunities in Spring MVC. What even is Spring MVC and why, you know, what is it and what does it even do? Well, the textbook definition of Spring MVC goes like this. Spring MVC is a library within Spring Framework that simplifies, simplifies HTTP requests and responses. But I'm going to give you the dumbed down version. It makes it super easy to set up websites. Okay, so what is the actual MVC part? MVC allows for the separation of business presentation and navigation logic. And basically this means this separates out certain parts of your app. So instead of having React as the actual front end for your app, Everything, like I said, is going to be contained within MVC and you can have web pages, you can do all of your controllers, you can build a whole entire website within a self-contained project and it separates everything out for you so that your app can actually scale well. But let's actually talk about what is MVC. Let's go into a little bit more in depth about what exactly is MVC and what, what does this acronym actually even stand for? So C is going to stand for the controller layer. The controller layer is going to be your URLs. And while we as people who are budding web developers don't really think about is how important the actual URLs are for your website. They control everything from your navigation to actually how you display detail pages, how you display list pages, and controllers are very important to software developers and not so much end users because we are the people who are in charge of doing all of this navigation with the URLs. A model layer is essentially a data representation and that is a very vague term, but at the end of the day, really what models are are representations of database tables. Now, if you don't know what a database table is, just realize that databases are essentially fancy Excel spreadsheets that hold lots of data and allow you to basically tie these forms of data together. And the models represent this and allow you to be able to take data out of a database and display them within your web app with relatively little trouble. So the second or the third is going to be the view layer. And whenever you are developing applications into React and Angular, the view layer is going to be handled by React. But in MVC, actually displaying data that we get back from the database onto a web page is going to be handled through the view layer. And the view layer is essentially a fancy term for a web page. But no MVC introduction would be complete without a description of what a dispatcher serverlet is. So a dispatcher serverlet is a code pattern that allows actual requests to go through this thing called a dispatcher serverlet. There's a very simple process about how these requests go through. So first the request is going to go through, then it is going to check a hand, what's called a handler mapping. And this handler mapping is going to check for your URL. So we actually talked about URLs for a little bit. This handler mapping is going to check the URL that you, or the request for the URL that you receive. And if it actually finds something within the handler mapping, it will then send it to a controller. The controller will then execute. And after the controller executes, that's when we will be shown the actual view or the web page. And it kind of makes sense. In order for these requests to be re routed to the exact functions that we are going to execute, 
it needs to be able to be guided through with this thing called a dispatcher serverlet and be shown the actual controllers. This is sometimes called a front controller pattern. And this is more or less just a pattern, a actual coding pattern that the dispatcher serverlet uses and not so much a actual description of the dispatcher serverlet. But sometimes you will see this work called a front controller. Just realize that the front controller is just a pattern. So enough theory, let's go ahead and get into the code and let's actually start setting up our Spring MVC application. So the first place that we want to go is a URL called start.spring.io. And this website is sometimes called the Spring Initializer. If you type in Spring Initializer into Google, it will be the first one. But what Spring Initializer does is essentially makes a Spring Boot application for us. Back in the day, we used to have to go get our own jars and do all of this crazy stuff to actually be able to set up a Spring Boot application or a Spring application, I should say. But nowadays, Spring Boot makes it so that we don't have to do any of that. It makes it super easy. So choose a Maven project, 2.75. I'm gonna call this Run Group. It's just a kind of a fun startup-y name for the running app that we're going to be building. And I'm going to call the artifact dot web could name it anything that you want to but that's just what i'm going to call it and i'm going to call this running application for 2022 yeah we're in 2022 okay and that looks good 217 and then what we want to do is we want to go over here to add dependencies and we want to type in web so we want spring web we want thyme leaf and Thymeleaf is the templating engine that's going to allow us to be able to show stuff on an actual web page. And we also want Spring Boot Dev Tools. We want Lombok, of course. We want Spring Data JPA. So Spring Data JPA. And we also want Postgres because I'm going to be using a Postgres database, but feel free to use whichever database that you want to. But if you don't want to worry about setting it up, I would go with post, Postgres. So this looks good for now. If we leave anything out, we can always go back and add it later. It's not that big of a deal if you miss anything. So I'm just going to go ahead and generate this. So what's going to happen is it's going to generate it. You want to go to the actual folder and right click on it and go ahead and start it up. But for security reasons, I'm going to try to obfuscate a lot of my folder. So I'm just gonna go ahead and show you the folder and open it real quick. So I've went ahead and extracted my spring initializer project into a document folder called web. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna right click it and I'm gonna open folder as IntelliJ idea project. And what's gonna happen is that it's going to essentially load up. It's probably going to take a little bit. And right now we are presented with an empty essentially Spring Boot project with nothing in it. And we have all of the normal suspect files that we always have. We have our main, we have our test. If you don't know what main is, main is where all the actual code is going to be housed. Test is where all the unit tests are going to be. And when we actually click run, we click the green arrow up here and we actually run it, a file that is going to be generated that's going to have all the actual code for everything to be ran. And that would be typically called a build. You don't need to worry about hardly anything except for the palm, the main, um, and all the folders within it. You need to worry about your web application because this is where the actual uh, beginning starts. But other than that, there's really not that much that you need to pay attention to. Don't pay attention to external libraries. Don't pay attention to scratches and consoles. Don't pay attention to the .maven. Everything, like I said, 90% of what you need is going to be here and within the palm.excel file, but we've already taken care of that. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to actually hook up the database. So I am going to use Postgres. If you don't have Postgres SQL installed, just type in Postgres install Windows or Postgres install Mac, whichever one that you like more or whichever one that you're using. Navigate to the actual official Postgres SQL.org download. Then go to download the installer and click which version that you want. Just pick the newest version for whichever operating system that you have, download it and install everything with it. There's, it's very, it's not complicated at all and just click through everything, install it and you'll also get a GUI. But 
We're not going to use the GUI, the actual Postgres GUI. I like to use the database manager that is built into IntelliJ because I think it's actually a lot more robust. It's a lot better. It's built right into it and there's no configuration. But we still have to actually set up the address for the database inside of application properties. So what you want to do is you want to go to source, you want to go to main, you want to go to resources, and then you want to click on this thing called application properties so that we can put the, the actual address for the Postgres database that we are planning on making. But the first thing that we want to do is let's go ahead and hook up our database in IntelliJ. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to click on the side here. So I go to database, I click this uh, plus button, I go down, I go to Postgres, and here is where I'm actually going to connect to the database. So I have Postgres at localhost, and my database password, I'm not going to share it with you. It's uh, even though it's a local database, but essentially you will be given a password and you'll be given a username whenever you actually install Postgres and that's what you want to put in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click apply and all of these actual databases or this actual database is going to be connected to IntelliJ. But we can't just stop there. We actually need to create a new database and we need to name it the actual name of the connection string. And what do I mean by that? So first what I'm gonna do is I'm going to call this run group course. Then I'm gonna click okay. So I've got my run group course set up. Let's go ahead and see here. So yep, I've got my database set up here. I went ahead and added it. If you didn't see that, I went to new, I went to database and I just quickly added a new database. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the actual string in here inside of my application. I need to, I'm in the console right now. I need to go to the application properties. So spring.datasource.url is going to equal to, and this is for the one that we just set up. It's going to be Postgres. So we'll say Postgres localhost 5432. And it's going to be the run group course. So we'll say run group course and make sure double check that you spelled that correctly run group course looks good okay so now we need to input the username so put the same exact username that you used to actually connect to the database in intellij so we'll go username and we'll call this postgres and just for uh example's sake this isn't the real password but the actual password i'm just going to say that the password was called test Yours will probably be different though. So spring dot data source. And we also need to put the driver class and it's going to be org.postgres.driver.url. And then we're going to also set what's called the DDL. And this will uh, set how the actual database will either create the tables for you. Will it drop the tables each and every time that you start up the app? And for mine, I prefer to choose update. So this will only update if it notices that any of the models have changed. If you choose create update or you choose drop, it will drop the database every single time. And in my opinion, that's kind of annoying. If I change it, I want the database to change, but if not, then I don't want the database to continually be dropping and uh, losing all the data that I put into it. So we also want to put the show SQL command to be true. And we do this because if you see a very long SQL creation string, that is a sign of a performance issue. So you always want to be able to see if you have any type of SQL performance issue. And the way that you can identify SQL performance issues is by seeing a super long SQL string being created. And that's a sign that you need to uh, either create a native query or you need to do something a little bit different. Okay, so that looks good. Fingers crossed, let's go ahead and boot it up. And if we boot it up and everything goes correctly, we will get a sign in the actual console that our app has started correctly and there were no issues. So I'm gonna go, go ahead here and we actually do have an issue. So I'm gonna go here and figure, try to figure out what exactly was wrong and we'll see if we can't troubleshoot this.
Okay, I see what I did wrong here. I misspelled Postgres. This is supposed to be Postgres QL. So hopefully if I add this QL and I haven't tested this, so I'm literally, if this fail, if this succeeds, this will be the first time that I've seen it. So I'm just gonna go here and go, and hopefully we should see everything go green and we are good to go. If everything has occurred that is supposed to be correct, we will see no errors here and we have zero errors in our console. We can finally move on to building our application. Anyway, that's going to be the video. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. If you did, make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. As always, thank you for watching.